So basically what I'm going to do is I, I really run this course off the wiki, right? So, okay, I go to today's lecture. And actually what I also might do is, of course, I might uh, use the Haskell system, if I find it. Okay. Right? So I'm going to use a Haskell system, like here. Okay, Glasgow Haskell interpreter. Actually, the link for the system, that's all on the page for the course. So, 2 plus 2, 4. That's a bad example, right? Okay, that's a much better example. So, well. That, that also works. Okay, so you already know how to program in Haskell. Anyway, so each lecture has this organization. There's basically in the beginning, well, some summary. There's a list of concepts, and today there's actually quite a bunch of concepts. Usually there are fewer concepts. This is because today I need to introduce you sort of broadly to functional programming. So this is, this is a lot. And actually, we, we are going to revisit some of these concepts in other lectures. Um, so concepts in a broad sense, you know, programming techniques or fundamental concepts in computer science. You know, pretty stupid things like, what is an algorithm? What is a compiler today? What is a software system? And then eventually down here, you see, uh, we will uh, also discuss things you know, dealing with functional programming specifically, like functional programming, function, function application, what this course is about, right? Then, because this is how this 101 companies project works, uh, we always reflect on what software languages we use, typically in this course, and luckily, we focus on Haskell. Also, we discuss we mentioned what sort of uh, technologies we use. Technologies in a broad sense, you know, like the examples that we see here is the Glasgow Haskell compiler and the Glasgow Haskell interpreter, I mean, of the compiler um, technology, and the Haskell platform. And actually, that's the first thing you should do. You should uh, install the Haskell platform, okay? And actually, in the first lab next week, this is also what we make sure that during that lab, you know, I mean, you have this thing installed. You can run the Glasgow Haskell interpreter as I just did, right? That's the basic thing. And you can also apply it to examples that you see today in the lecture. And you can apply it to examples that are linked here on this website. Uh, we are going to use things that we call contributions. These are little systems of the so-called 101 competency system. I will say more about this. So these are bigger examples, you know, bigger examples than this, okay? So in basically in the lab, we make sure you have a Haskell platform on your system or you know how to do this if you don't bring your laptop, but you should. And you know how to run examples. Okay, so this is concepts, languages, technologies, features. Features is features of this one-on-one -on -one comedy system you will see this is a human resources management system, personal basin, yeah? uh, that can do things like represent companies, departments, and where you can total salaries or cut salaries. And so this is basically sort of the running example for this course, right? We will keep on implementing salary cut, salary total. That's the running example we will see basically in each and every lecture, and we will learn Haskell programming through that running example. Okay, so, so what I will do now is I will basically just walk through these concepts, perhaps sort of sequentially. Sometimes I will also navigate um, from those concepts to other concepts. But by the end of the lecture, we should have covered that ground. Okay, let's try So, I mean, basically we can't start right away with the notion of function or function, functional programming because, I mean, I need to make sure, at least for those 
who have no uh, background in computer science, I mean, on programming, in terms of another course. So I need to set up some basic terms, right? So the basic term I choose to start with is software system. So by the way, you see how this works on this wiki. It's more or less like Wikipedia. So you have, for each concept, you have a page. Um, so what we call headline is sort of the summary of the description, very short summary. So, I mean, basically when we want to learn functional programming, we want to build, eventually when we do programming in general, we want to build software systems, right? I mean, you might say we want to write programs, but you know, ultimately what we want to do is we want to build software systems. What are software systems? These are systems of communicating components, you know, based on software, okay? Um, so what is, a, what is an example of a software system? Well, CLIPS, what we use for management of, of the study process, is a software system, right? Your browser is a software system. Facebook is a software system. And we are going to use this one one companies system. It's a human resources management system. Let's just click it to get an idea. I mean, if you don't know UML, then it's uh, perhaps a little bit complicated. But I think more than half of you know UML, and for the other ones, they, they get an idea, right? So this is a class diagram. So we've got companies, we've got departments, we've got employees. That's the 101 company system, that we have structures like this. And then what you don't see is that we might want to do all kinds of operations on this stuff, like cutting salaries. You know, these salaries here, total salaries. You might want to store these companies. We might, might want to serialize them. We might want to use them in web programming and distributed programming, all kinds of stuff. But it's essentially a human resources management system. That's our running example, okay? So you know what the system is. Let's just um, see what's next. Now, when you build systems, systems are subject to requirements. I mean, obviously, you know, when you build a system or when you write a program, you need to say what you expect from this program. Uh, you use requirements when you build a new system. You also use requirements when you change a system, right? There's different ways how you can classify requirements. Uh, it's very common to speak of functional requirements, and actually it doesn't have to do that much with functional programming, well, sort of, but it's sort of the functions that the system should provide to the user, right? So you are a Facebook user, and you want to make sure that you can block messages coming from me. That's a, that's a functional requirement you might have, okay? Or you might have a non-functional requirement, such as the system needs to be fast in a certain way, and then, you, and then you quantify what you mean by fast, right? Or you have data requirements, like the system needs to be able to store birthday dates, right? Or the system needs to be able to represent family relationships, okay? And then you have UI, user interface requirements. The system needs to provide me with a selection box for my friends when I want to send a message to one of my Facebook friends. Okay? So this is sort of the foundation for building software systems that you, that you can talk about requirements. And I mean, let's just go here one feature that we will also talk a bit more about today is the feature total, like a, a requirement for the one-on-one -on -one company system, which basically says, I want to be able to total all salaries in a company, right? So if you know SQL, SQL, 
right? Then this is how you would do it on a database. We will have to learn how we do this in Haskell. Some of you know how to do this in Java or in other languages, right? But the requirement, which we call a feature of the system here, the requirement is I want to be able to sum up the salaries of all employees in a company and of course that sum should be presented to the user. For example, the CAO of a company wants to know how much salary uh, is spent on, on the employees. Okay? I mean, so this is really an important term when we talk about programming and software development that we have a notion of requirement. Now, what's next? Well, I mean, let's, let's get a little bit simpler, right? I mean, okay, we understand, you know, in the end we deal with systems, so systems are complicated, potentially complicated architectures. I mean, these are compo components that, that communicate with each other. For example, when you use Facebook, you have a client on your, in your browser, you have, you know, Facebook has, has, has a server, actually it has tons of servers, right? And everything is, you know, lots of components, lots of communication. So in the end, let's talk about programs. Yeah? Let's get simpler. What is a program? I mean, there's actually all kinds of funny definitions, and that's perhaps a good moment to uh, explain you how you can get more out of this wiki. So usually, we don't have elaborate definitions of anything on this wiki, because usually, there's a much better definition already somewhere else. You know, Wikipedia or some other online resource might already define what a program is. So actually, if you go down here, of course, on Wikipedia, there's something, they call it computer program. We call it program. <laughs> Nevertheless, we, we kind of clarify that what we talk about here, this is what Wikipedia calls computer program, right? And so, so this is still not working, Andre. But fortunately, I know how to do it. Um, open a new tab. That works. So, so you can always navigate from, uh, you know, from our wiki to Wikipedia. I mean, I'm not suggesting that Wikipedia is generally the, the ultimate resource for learning programming, but at least, you know, this is one of the experiences that we provide, that you can always try to explore farther on Wikipedia. This is what you guys are doing anyhow. You know, I was, for some years, I was naive enough to tell you about textbooks that you should read. Well, that's on the website. I mean, you should still do this. I mean, I keep on telling. But um, realistically, many of you will essentially use Google or Bing, preferably, and uh, Wikipedia. And I mean, that's the reality, right? So therefore, we support this reality by linking our resources to standard resources out there. Anyway, so let me explain what the program is. Actually, if you go to Wikipedia, what it says is a program is a sequence of instructions written to perform a specified task, and so on. So this is, especially in a course on function programming, not really what I like. But this is a very established definition or style of definition of what a program is. You know, sequence of instructions. First do this, then do this. Perhaps do that, assign something to this verbal, I mean, at least instruction by instruction. This is definitely not what a functional program is, right? So, so therefore, in this particular case, I actually take a stand and disagree with Wikipedia. And I say, you know, a program is an executable software artifact, okay, that solves a certain problem. Namely, a problem that is amenable to automation on a computer. I mean, it doesn't serve, solve your, let's say, social problems, right? Uh, it only, well, perhaps when they are solvable through Facebook on a computer, then it's okay. Uh, anyway, so, but you get the idea. In fact, one class of problems that is amenable to automation on a computer is called algorithmic problems. Okay, so let's see what they are. 
Well, algorithmic problems are problems that can be solved with an algorithm. Okay. Well, that, that you know that's the definition. Uh, sorry. And actually, in this case, you see, uh, I'm not defining much more about it because if you go, uh, well. No, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, actually, Wikipedia doesn't have that term. It, however, you know, it, it's sort of established. So, but fortunately, Wikipedia knows what an algorithm is. So, and here I give examples. I mean, some of them you might know. Greatest common divisor, right? Two numbers computed in the greatest common divisor. Or factorial function, right? right? Or we will talk later about a search problem, that you search a number in a, in a list. These are problems that are algorithmic problems because they can be solved with an algorithm. Okay, what is an algorithm? Well, it's a step-by-step -step procedure for achieving a certain I.O. behavior. Well, it's, it's a little bit problematic because it, again, feels like instruction-based, right? But okay, we, we, we can't totally revise old terminology to be sort of functional programming-centric. Anyway, so... I mean, there's much more being said here about uh, what an algorithm is, but it's essentially a recipe for solving a certain problem with a computer, step by step, right? And we might, we might, uh, we might impose additional conditions on it, like it should terminate, right? Or it should, uh, the next step is always uh, uniquely determined, Right? Okay, but let's, you know, I'm doing this in a bit more in detail in the OPM lecture, and, and this is done more formally elsewhere. So for now, let's say, you know, an algorithm is a step by step procedure for solving uh, certain problems with a computer. And I mean, just to give you an idea, let's look at something you, you should know greatest common di divisor, right? So how does one approach to greatest common divisor work. Well, you've got two numbers. Well, in, in this particular approach here, we assume that these are two positive numbers, x and y. So how do you compute the greatest common div divisor? Well, you repeat certain steps until some condition holds. So you repeat the steps until x equals y. And so when in this loop here, you check if x greater than y, then you subtract y from x, otherwise you subtract the other way around, right? So this is how you compute greatest common divisor. And just for those who know Java, you know, when you have this sort of semi-formal algorithmic description, it's of course easy to map this to, let's say, Java or any modest language for that matter. Right? And just to show you how this could be written down in Haskell, this could be written down like this in Haskell. Okay? I mean, I will not explain each and every detail here right now, but just to give you an idea, this is the signature of the function. It says that if you compute the greatest common divisor, let's say you take one int, you take another int, and you return the result, which is also an int. Okay, this is the signature. And then this is the definition. So we have like three cases here. We have the case that x greater than y. If so, we subtract y from x as we did in the semi-formal description. And then we recursively invoke the function. Right? We will say more about recursion. But this is already a nice function. Right? So we have multiple cases. So, you know, we have also a case for x uh, below y, and we have a case otherwise, which obviously must mean that x equals y, right? So you see how this function nicely breaks down into cases. You see that we receive arguments like this, and you see that on the right-hand side of the equal sign, we return some result, but this could be very well a recursive application of the same function. Okay? I mean, just to give you an idea. So this is one algorithmic problem that we have solved now in three different ways, right? Well, we have 
we have given a, a semi-formal description of this algorithmic problem by describing it like this we at least have shown that we can give it in a step-by-step -step fashion right and then we have said okay let's let's become real let's implement this in in a extra programming language we have done it in Java if you don't know Java no problem right and we can also do it in Haskell right and then it looks like this a general observation that you should draw at this point though the Haskell program is always shorter okay and this actually this this will improve once we start to do interesting things okay so let's see where we stand now we, we have talked about program right um, we already have started to, to, to run into these concepts in a way right so now let's just mention some more obvious concepts I mean obvious at this point I guess what is a programming language I mean there, there's different ways how you can define it well it's a language let's say a set of strings for example in which programs are written so what are programs programs are executable descriptions right and so a language is a programming language just kind of builds sets on these uh, on these programs and obviously we've got all kinds of programming languages I mean Haskell is a programming language Java is a programming language C is considered to be a programming language by some and there are many other programming languages okay should be pretty obvious at this point now now we said that we said that a program is an executable description of some you know step to step or whatever procedure um, but I mean how do we execute exactly these programs and there are two ways of doing this one is that we use an interpreter the other one is that we use a compiler both of these options we will also use for Haskell okay let's start perhaps with the uh, interpreter what is an interpreter actually an interpreter happens to be also program okay so it's something that you know it doesn't compute greatest common divisor rather what it does is it well executes programs so it's actually what people call a meta program it's a program about programs rather than integers okay so an interpreter is a program that executes programs so for example let's say you have some nice program here let's say hello world you know something that's supposed to print hello world then you can you can run the Python interpreter on that program and it prints hello world okay so what is the hello world program the hello world program is indeed the program that outputs hello world I mean it's one it's one very well understood program it you know it's it's not particularly powerful but uh, you can do it like this in Java right this is uh, the Java version that uh, prints hello world I mean for those who know Java and when you actually compile so we will get there in a second so Java is a compiled language when you compile this code into bytecode then you can interpret the bytecode and it will indeed print hello world um, this is the hello world program in Python right so it just prints hello world so this is how it looks like and when you run it with the Python interpreter as we just have seen it also prints just hello world okay so and let's say we do this in Haskell I actually don't have the hello world program in a file but I can just start the interpreter so this is the interpreter and let's say what I can do is I can copy the the Python program and it works so you see uh, you can run Python programs within Haskell no that's actually not true it just happens that it works for this program <laughs> um, but anyway you, you get the idea so 
I mean, Python and Haskell are as different as languages could be. This is probably the only, the only uh, program that they have in common. Um, well, I'm exaggerating. Anyway, so this is how interpretation works, right? I mean, your program could be in a file, but as you see here, an interpreter might also take the program from the command line. This is interpretation. And actually, this is also cool with languages like Python and, 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 and Haskell. You, you can just work like this. You don't need to work like that, right? Write some horrible files and, and uh, you know, with all kinds of boilerplate code around it and then, you know, run it. Uh, it's, it's an interpreted language, Haskell, so it's, it's much nicer in that sense. So what is a... What is a compiler, though, just for understanding? Because we can also compile things in Haskell. Because when you want to have, when you want to build bigger systems, and when you want to get some speed in execution, you might want to compile things. So the compiler is actually a program. It doesn't execute the program right away. It rather transforms programs into some object code. You know, like machine language or for Java, it's bytecode. So it, it transforms it into some other representation which can be hopefully interpreted much more efficiently, right? Uh, so for example, I mean, for those who know Java, or, or, okay, you know how it works. You invoke the Java compiler, right? And, um, well, and then you have, as a result of the compilation, you have bytecode and, you know, then you can uh, interpreted bytecode. So, you know, you have interpretation is just deferred to a later step. Anyway, I could also now show you how to compile in Haskell, but I defer this to the lab or to a later point. Uh, it basically works like this. You know, you have a source file, you invoke the Glasgow Haskell compiler, you get some result, you run the result. Okay? So let's see where we stand. Well, I think we are ready to, to say what functional programming is. And it's very easy at this point. I mean, functional programming is essentially what, what people call a programming paradigm. So it's a certain way of doing things in programming, right? And each paradigm sort of emphasizes a certain abstraction as being the top, as being the primary abstraction. So in functional programming, the key abstraction is the notion of function very much in the mathematical sense. And so the means of computation, I mean how you actually execute programs, is that you evaluate function applications. So basically, it's not, like, it's not like assignment in imperative programming. There's nothing like objects, you know, that encapsulate stuff and then send messages to each other. No, it's functions that are applied to arguments, and you look at the results, okay? So here's another Haskell function. This is the factorial function. You see, it takes an argument n, it um, looks at the argument, are you zero? If so, then this is the base case for, for factorial, then we return one. And otherwise, we compute the product of n times recursively factorial applied to n minus one. So this is a nice function, right? This is, this is a functional program. And actually, we can now go and well, let's just do this. Um, <coughs> nope, yep. Uh, no, I don't want to go here. So here is the, you know, here's the fact, oh, here's another by example. Great. So this is not even not even factorial, this is even simpler, increment, right? 
So we define an increment function, takes a number, and adds one to it. Okay, we can we can run this function. So now I loaded this file into the interpreter. So this you can you can sort of capture some test case if you like in this main function. So if I now run the main function, of course it will increment 41. And you see, we have applied the increment function to 41. We have previously defined the increment function. This is how functional programming works. We define functions, we apply functions to arguments, and then we actually evaluate those function applications. Okay? We don't run statements, we don't execute statements, I mean instructions. No, we apply functions to arguments and we evaluate those applications. Okay. So let's see. Um, I mean, I basically already made this point, right? So, so these things come in, in, in a package. So the key notion of function programming is, is the notion of function, like mathematical function. And then, of course, in order to have a programming paradigm around that, you need a, you need a means of defining functions, like we just did with increment, right? And, of course, you need a notion of function application. Okay? Function application works really like a charm. Here, increment, function application, when we evaluate this, this is the result. This is basically the basic paradigm. I mean, of course, it will get much more interesting, but I mean, this is, this is really the basic notions that you, that you need to work with. Function, function definition, function application, okay? So, now, we were discussing algorithmic problems, right? So we were looking at factorial, increment, greatest common divisor. So just for fun, let's look at another problem, because I mean, I want to get out of this number uh, domain, right? I just, I mean, that's, that's all interesting, but we want to do some other kinds of problems. So the search problem. What is the search problem? It's an algorithmic problem, uh, and, it, and it deals with the question whether we can find a certain value, a given value, in a given list. Really simple. It's about the problem of finding a given value in a list. So it is an algorithmic problem because we can describe it by this sort of step-by-step -step procedure, right? We can say, no, no, sorry. I mean, it's an algorithmic problem because we can, we can provide such a step-by-step -step procedure. But here is actually only the problem description, right? The problem consists of the, of the question, you know, does the value occur in the list? If so, we are supposed to return true, otherwise we return false. Now, um, It is an algorithmic problem because we can provide some algorithm for it. And one of these ways of how we can provide an algorithm for it is called linear search. Okay? So why is, why is linear search more interesting than, let's say, greatest common divisor? Why does it add anything? Because it, we are now dealing with lists, right? I mean, ultimately in programming you're dealing with many kinds of types. Numbers, strings, characters, booleans. But we are specifically interested, certainly in function programming, in compound data, such as lists. Okay? So, the search problem can be solved uh, in this manner, and this is what we call linear search. We basically use the index variable i. We sort it zero, zero for the first element in the list. Okay, and then we repeat these steps until some result has been obtained. And so we return false if we ever hit the end of the list, which means i equals the length of L. 
and we return true if the list L ever stores V at the current index I. And if neither of these two cases applies, then we increment the index, so we keep on searching linearly throughout this list, right? So this is clearly an algorithmic description. Again, it's sort of semi-formal. And in Haskell, it looks like this. So just, just ignore that part. That's, again, the function signature explaining what the type of the function is. But it's, it looks a little bit scary, certainly, for the first lecture. So let's pretend it's not there, OK? More interestingly, let's look at the actual definition of the function. This is how linear search looks like in Haskell. What we say is, hey, if the list that we're looking at is empty, so this is the empty list, right? So if we see the empty list, no matter what value we're looking for, there's actually no hope left that this value could be in this empty list, right? So we can return false right away. So this is one case, empty list, no search has failed. Non-empty list, and this is how we talk about the non-empty list, we do pattern matching on the structure of lists. So this is the pattern for the empty list, this is the pattern for the non-empty list. If we face a non-empty list with the head x, the first element x, and the tail, or the remaining elements, x's, well, what we do then is we check whether the first element indeed equals the element y that we look for. Well, if so, we have found y. Or we try to find y in the tail of the list, in the rest of the list. Okay? So this is how you, so, you know, you get an idea. This is sort of the semi-formal description, you know, how usually people write down algorithmic descriptions. It's a little bit more step-by-step, step, a little bit more imperative, right? And this is how you would do it in a, in a functional programming language, right? You would recursively process lists, basically by treating the two cases, empty list, non-empty list, and this is how it works in a functional programming language. I mean, here's also, here's also some test code, if you like, right? So, so by the way, you should usually be able to just copy and paste this code into a little uh, test program, right? Probably some of you already are doing this. Very good. Um, copy and paste it into your main.hs file, or copy and paste it more or less, well, into your interpreter session. Well, that doesn't quite work like that. Um, and then you can play with these things, right? Okay. So, yeah, so this has, this has taken us pretty far already. Um, So, you know, we have discussed lists. I mean, there are, of course, many other data structures we will eventually see. And actually, a progr programmer can also define new uh, data structures. But for today, I mean, that's, that's a good data structure uh, example. And we were already discussing pattern matching. So let me just show you a little bit more pattern matching. Because pattern matching is really also a key ingredient of functional programming. I mean, we were just using pattern matching for linear search, right? So here's some, here's some even simpler examples of, of uh, pattern matching. Suppose you have pairs, right? So pairs like two things that are grouped together. Then a typical function on pairs would be a function called first, written like this, okay? Um, and it would be defined on the pattern for a pair, right? So you would say, if I want to take the first component of a pair, well, then I match like this, I bind the first component to x, and actually the underscore means I don't care exactly what this is, because I'm not going to talk about it on the right-hand side. 
right? And then you return x on the right-hand side. So you have projected from a pair to one of its components, and you have used pattern matching to take apart the pair. Of course, you can also do this for the second component. Well, then you flip around the pattern. Or, as you have seen, you can also do this for lists. So if you want to, for example, obtain the head of a list, well, then you match on this pattern here. This is the pattern for non-empty list. So this column, this column we also call this the cons constructor. So this is, uh, uh, you know, from this. Anyway, but the, the key idea here is that obviously we have a pattern with two positions. You know, the head and the tail of a non-empty list. So here we return the head, here we return the tail. Pretty simple examples. Or here's a slightly more interesting example, right? The length function. The length function takes an arbitrary list and it's supposed to return the length of the list. So it has two cases, one for the empty list, then it returns zero, of course, and one for the non-empty list. Well, then essentially it uses recursion to determine the length of the tail, and it increments that by one. So this is, this is basically a very good example. I mean, this is the kind of function that you should dream about tonight. Um, you know, because it has, it has all the ingredients. It has pattern matching. It even has multiple equations. You know, it, it basically discriminates on the input. Someone's already going to dream. Um, it uses recursion, right? So it invokes... It defines the function by invoking the same function, hopefully on a simpler argument, right? This is the case. I mean, it's not the same list. It's a simpler list, right? Therefore, this recursion makes sense. So I think that's uh, what I want to say about functions and pattern matching. So we have six more minutes. No, we actually, we have actually, no, we are supposed to run until 13.45, right? Yes, very good. Okay, so at least these concepts are now, have now been discussed a little bit. So basically what I want to do is I want to show you a slightly bigger system. Okay? I want, I mean, program if you like. So what I'm going to do is here, I want to show you this human resources management system, Haskell Starter. I mean, you will not understand all the details, but just that you get some basic ideas. And then, you know, we will come back to this example also in the lab, and you will eventually get all the fine details. So, so basically, we want to write down a Haskell program that models companies. Well, in this case, we don't even have departments. So companies are just, you know, just containers of employees. And then we want to write down some functions like to total these salaries, okay? So this is, and I haven't talked really about this much, but this is how you define the types in your Haskell program. So here we say we need a type called company. And what is this type? Well, it's basically, it's basically a set of pairs. You know, companies consist of company names, which are essentially strings, and lists of employees. So this notation means lists of employees. Okay? So what are employees? Employees are obviously triples. They consist of name, address, and salary. Okay? What are names? Names are strings. Addresses are strings. For our purposes, salaries are floating point numbers. Okay? So, I mean, again, we will, we will talk more in detail about this sort of notation. So this is sort of data modeling in Haskell. This is how you define new types, and there's much more to this. But you get overall an idea, right? In this case, we are just dealing with pairs and tribbles and, and lists. And we will see more of this. Now, this is how a sample company looks like. 
It's the so-called ECMEC Corporation. If you don't know what ECMEC Corporation is, just Google it. It's a, it's a perfect example of an imaginary corporation. Um, and so, and these are the employees of this company. So obviously Ralph is also employed by this company and as it happens, my salary is rather bad. But that's okay for now. So this is how we, this is how we can represent concrete data in, uh, in Haskell, right? It's not a number, it's not a stupid list of numbers. No, it's a little bit more complicated, more nested data structure, right? I mean, it's basically at this level, at this level, it's a, it's a pair of name and employees. Then you see at this level, it's just a list of employees, right? And at that level, it's just a triple for the individual employee. Okay, it's just lists and tuples, okay? Now, we want to do some stuff with these uh, companies. For example, we want to compute total that is, we want to map a given company to a float where the float should, you know, describe the total of all salaries of all employees in that company. So how do we do this? Well, actually, we need a bunch of functions, right? We need an entire family of functions doing this. So we start with this function total here. Well, obviously, the name is not relevant to the total of all salaries. So therefore, it doesn't occur on the right-hand side here. So we, you know. But what we do is we use an auxiliary function, total ES, like total employees, uh, which essentially drills into these employees, OK? This is the function. It takes a list of employees and, again, maps them to a float. So how does it do it? Well, if the list of employees is empty, then the total of salaries is zero. If the list of employees is not empty, well, then we have to somehow obtain the salary from the first employee, and we also have to obtain the salaries, or the sum thereof, from the tail of the list of employees, and we just add them, okay? I mean, it's, it's, it's totally obvious, I mean, what you have to do here, right? You just iterate recursively, so to say, over the list structure of the employees. And now we are at the point that we are, have to say how we extract the salary from an employee. Well, how do we do this? Well, we just look at the triple for the employee. We are not interested in a name. We are not interested in the address. We are only interested in the salary part, and we return that salary part. Okay, and this is the uh, this is the complete implementation. This is how we total all salaries of all employees in a given company. That's 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 everything we need to write. Okay, it can be done much shorter, but this is uh, one way of doing it. So, and how do we test this? Well, we just do a function application, right? We apply our total function to our sample company, and this is what we get as a result. So we can, I can also do this at the command line. Uh, let's say, where are we? Um, so this contribution lives somewhere on my file system, and you can easily download it. Uh, Haskell starter. Okay, here we got the main function, the main module. Everything is in there, what you have seen, right? Doot, doot, doot. Okay. So I can just run this file with the interpreter. Okay, now we are ready to do things with this file. So I can just say what, what it said here, total sample company. Okay, fine. So, so it works exactly as shown on the website. Okay. So, I mean, we can also cut the sample company. Well, we can actually even look at the sample company. So here, 
We can enter sample company. This is a trivial function application, right? It's a constant. Good. Okay, this is the sample company. We can now also cut the sample company. Okay, so we get back some company that obviously uh, has even lower salaries, right? Um, what we can also do is we can also apply total to cut of sample company, right? Then we total whatever salaries we still have in this company that was cut. We can also push this farther, right? We can cut again. And it's getting less, obviously. It should, right? I should just show the definition, then it's clear. And that's actually a good question. So, so on this page, I didn't show the cut function because I didn't want to show too much. But you can always see all the nifty details. What you can do here, you can go to the repository, right? And now we will see how everything is implemented. I mean, obviously, I have everything downloaded already on my system. OK, now you're on the repository. Uh, we use GitHub for what it matters. OK, here's the source, and here's the main module that we were just playing with. So here's, again, all the stuff. Here's the sample company. Here's the total function we were looking at. And now here's the cut function. What does the cut function do? It takes a company, or returns a company, and it's supposed to cut all salaries by half. So how does it do it? Well, when it hits an employee, divides the salary by two, okay? Other than that, it preserves everything. It preserves the name of the company. It basically recomposes all these lists of employees, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally took for granted that everyone knows what a salary cut is. I mean, I guess it's uh, not, not uh, you haven't encountered a salary cut, so. <laughs> um, good. So I think, I mean, this, this should be enough in terms of showing you this example a little bit. Um, so you see, everything I've talked about is linked from this page. Right, so this is the contribution I was talking about. Uh, these are the features that I was showing you, the cut feature, the total feature. And the flatness feature just means that we were, that we were dealing with flat companies, you know, boring flat companies, rather than hierarchically nested companies. Uh, a few more things that I should point out. So what's called information here, this is always some bits of information that you might find useful. So, for example, let's suppose, uh, lasst uns einfach mal annehmen, dass, dass, dass ihr nicht so zufrieden damit seid, dass ich das alles in Englisch mache. Und ihr fragt euch jetzt, wie ihr die, die uh, deutschen Begriffe findet. Gibt es eine ganz einfache Technik? Habe ich hier beschrieben. Ähm, basiert ja einfach darauf, dass wir immer mit Wikipedia verbinden. Ja, es ist trivial. Wir verbinden uns immer mit Wikipedia. Auf Wikipedia könnt ihr die Sprache umschalten und schon wisst ihr auch, wie der Begriff heißt. Also hier steht jetzt nichts Besonderes, hier steht einfach nur erklärt, angenommen Sie wissen nicht, was Sorting Algorithm äh, auf Deutsch heißt, was machen Sie? Sie klicken natürlich auf Sorting Algorithm und dann ändern Sie einfach hier die Sprache auf Deutsch und schon wissen Sie, dass das Sortierverfahren ist. Was sind die anderen Sachen hier? Also hier ist zum Beispiel Download. Was ist Download? Das zum Beispiel erklärt, wie Sie die Quellen die hier verwendet werden, wie Sie die runterladen können. Und weil das besonders schön ist, ähm, hier war eigentlich auch mal ein YouTube-Video, but the YouTube-Video I don't see. Well, anyway, there, there used to be a YouTube-Video. Uh, so, so, actually, this wiki is under heavy development, so, you know, don't, don't expect too much, okay? Anyway, so, 
einfach nur so als, als Hinweis, immer mal schauen, das sind sozusagen so ein paar Tipps, die Sie vielleicht nutzvoll finden. Gut, ähm, dann soll es mal im Prinzip für heute gewesen sein, also was machen wir das nächste Mal? Wir werden einfach mehr eindringen in die Programmierung, indem wir uns mehr Algorithmen angucken, Suchprobleme, Sortierprobleme, einfache Datenstrukturen bzw. Datentypen, äh, im Prinzip auch Dinge, die wir in OOPM gemacht haben, wenn sie da waren, nur dass wir das jetzt eben alles funktional machen. Okay, tschüss.